Hey, we're listening to Abyss Gazing, a horror podcast where we celebrate all things spooky and mental health. I'm Billy, one of your hosts. <laughs> Threw me off, Mark. I see how it is. Hi, <laughs> Mark, your other co-host. <laughs> and I am Josh, the other co-host, the one that, that has not had their brains carved out and turned into a trick or treat bowl. I really and, thought really thought about just like sitting here and making faces for the whole episode. Like Well, I mean, <laughs> this this is a penis safe uh environment here. So Oh, is that is that what we're going with? Well, we've got uh before we jump into our main feature for this week, we gave Billy an initiation by covering a film that Mark and I talked about last year. And that is Eldridge USA. So if you guys haven't checked out our popcorn uh, film fest or popcorn frights fe- uh, episode from last year, go check it out. Mark and I talked about it. Billy, you got a few minutes. Open up. Let us know what you thought. <laughs> so first, you got Mark to watch a musical and he picked it on his own. So that threw me off for a lot. The fact because that it was one, I didn't realize it was a musical for some dumbass reason. And two... <laughs> It was Lovecraft inspired, and I will always check those out. So, I mean, I really liked it. So, I don't know if that shocks you, Mark, but oh, Josh hated that, it. Josh, I just spied it. It was so bad. You know, it? Wow. So, yeah, I actually liked it. The fact that one, it was a musical, and two, that it was one of those that's off the left field to where it's like a comical kind of comical one to me to where it's zombies. Come on. It's zombies. It's it's just a zombie movie that you go in enjoying. And I went in not knowing anything about it. So that might've helped me too. Yeah. Yeah. I just, I, I despise musicals, but for some reason I got a kick out of this one. And I've noticed a handful of the movies that we watched during popcorn fright fest last year are starting to get release dates finally yes yeah there's a there's another i think invoking yell just got a release date if i'm not yep. if i'm not mistaken but billy where does it land on the rorschach rating scale for you i actually gave it at least an eight out of, how, ten? out of ten yeah oh. oh four out of five all right well on that I note i mean i could give it a six out of five then if you'd like but I, I liked it. <laughs> you guys can check it out for yourselves beginning uh, on DVD and Blu-ray beginning October 22nd of this year. And then it'll also be available digitally and on demand uh, starting November 5th. But on this episode, we are counting down the days. I don't know if I'm more. I don't know if I'm like the only one that's excited for this. This one was like high on my list of things to do but we're we're doing for the first time ever out of sight of a film festival tradition we're doing a double feature and this one is of course talking about terrifier and terrifier 2 i love these movies i'm kind of curious where everyone else lands Marley. oh i've seen them before well, I actually them watched times. them. I watched them for the first time last weekend. Yeah. So, it, uh, I liked them. I mean, there are parts that, I mean, me and my son were sitting there like, well, they should have done this and this would have been better. But I still liked the movie. It was, I had seen all the memes and everything. So, it it helped now to go back and look at the memes. It's like, oh, okay, I know what's going on. <laughs> but, yeah, there's, there's a lot of stuff about them. I kind of like two better than one but i think that's just personal preference because it got a little bit more gory and all to it to me but i may be wrong mark i kind of like one a touch more than two because i think some of the extra backstory and side things were a bit much and caused it to drag a little but it's still i mean they're both it's it's almost like if a slasher and saw had a baby to me it kind of falls in that 
kind of torture porn and slasher kind of in between. You're not wrong. I side with Billy. I think the normally I like films that are a little bit simplistic. I think the simpler a film can be, the more it can thrive. Whereas I kind of feel like with the first one, we'll talk more about it in, in a little bit, but I think I think it kind of caps itself and its potential with the, the single shot location. I think it doesn't get to explore its full potential as a character. And I think now in hindsight, we know that it's largely because of budgetary restraints where this is like an end. Of, this is like the modern day thing of like the little film that could, you know, this is the equivalent of something like Halloween or Blair Witch Project that we're seeing in real time. The second one, it, it garnered such buzz during festivals runs that it, it gave us the second one. Second one is one of those films that I used to think a lot like you, Mark. I thought that uh, it was really busy. I was like, why is it so long? And the more that I've come back to rewatch it, the more that it's grown on me. And that's partially why I really love it. I love the exploration of the mythology, the expansion of the lore. I love all of the backstory stuff. Uh, to me also, Sienna is like the queen of modern horror in terms of final girl i would watch a, anything with her in it i am just like compelled by not only uh her perf lauren lavera's performance but also just the way that everything like kind of unfolds and like this like mystery that is like you know surrounding this sword her father uh his mysterious death her connection to art like I, I love that there's like this expansion of it but also at the same time that there is this um that there's like this like mysterious connection and ambiguity that we don't quite know yet yeah and the connection seemed like it was not just towards her it's like her whole family and not try i mean if we're going into it it's part of it was can people see them or can they not? Or, you know, there was one part that kind of felt like, I hate to say a Freddy kind of movie, but when it starts out, you're not sure if it's a dream or if it's real. And, you know, she brings out the sword between the dream and real. So, yeah, I think overall, I think this is my hypothesis for this podcast. I think there's going to be very little to say about the first film, and there's going to be a lot more to say about the second film. Well, the first one was kind of your introduction, and there's, very, I mean, very little story to it. It's just the introduction of art and false. False, very false. I didn't get to watch it, but there is what a pre. I know uh, he premiered in something else. Yeah, so well, he's he as premiered. A, he was just like a side character in that. No, no. He so Ter Terrifier actually existed as a short film in 2011 first, and then the film got such buzz. There's actually a callback and the, the so the ending like uh, end credit scene where Vicky is kind of like writing all of those like words with the blood on the wall. That's a callback to the final shot in the short film. Um, you can you can stream it for free on Tubi. It's it's a it's a great little thing. But you're right. Like his like main introduction outside of that was for All Hallows Eve, which is this. Uh, anthology film that leon kind of did before expanding to terrifier i forgot where i was going <laughs> that way oh. you, you had a character <laughs> that was introduced we're establishing his introduction i mean he had the what the clip and the segment and all hollows eve and he had a short so as a yes he had Go I was ahead. gonna I was gonna say he's he's kind of the the glue that sticks All Hollows Eve together. Like okay, yes, well, I haven't seen All Hollows Eve. You're yet. not I'm wrong. Gonna... All Hollows Eve is, is something I do recommend. It's it's a it's a good little <laughs> anthology film. Go ahead. Continue. <laughs> 
Are you sure? No more yeah. faces or gas. Uh, well, or we'll see. We'll see. Continue. Or... Continue. <laughs> no promises. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the hacksaw to the vagina was awesome in the first one. There. Have fun with that. <laughs> If you want that, you can just watch Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2. Yeah, I I think that uh, going into the first one, I'm not. I don't say that I don't necessarily hate. Like I I dislike the first one because by all means, is I've seen it several times. I I see it anytime they re-release it in theaters. I really enjoy the first one. I think that just the first, the second one, kind of takes those ideas that Leon had and really asks this question of how can we do this and kind of expand upon this. And I, I really love the, the vagina scene um, in this one is like, it, it's, it's still one of the best modern like gags in all of horror. Like you can say whatever you will about like, you know, other horror movies that might have like good gags, like that's easily a top five gag that we're still talking about almost 10 years later. Oh. Yeah. And I mean, it, not specifically that, but it did predict it a little bit. Cause she's like, why would I be scared? What you think he's going to chop us up or something? And that's exactly what he did to her. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, I will also say that uh, one thing that Leon kind of does uh, really well in these movies is takes expectations that we've known uh, about the genre and really flips it on its side. So another really great example of that, conventionally speaking, Dawn is would really be kind of considered the the classic final girl because you know she's. She's, you know, a young adult. She's blonde. She's kind of wearing a skimpy outfit in this one. And one of the first lines that she says in this movie was, that was the longest piss that I've ever taken. Yeah. And it's such a, it's such a throwaway line. But when you really kind of think about it and you look at other big name slashers like, you know, Freddie or Jason, Michael, Leatherface, you know, insert here you conventionally wouldn't see a a beautiful quote unquote final girl say stuff like that. And I I'm really glad that they're kind of like exerting exert averting kind of expectations with this film. And he does it in the end with Vicky to where, you know, we think that we are gonna actually see, you know, um why am I blanking um, a Monica, a Tara, sorry, Tara, you know, you really think that uh, Tara is going to be the final girl after the whole vagina scene. And then it diverts again. And it's like, okay, now meet Vicky. She's going to be the true final girl and the true connection. That's going to be expanded upon in future sequels. Doesn't she end up becoming one of Arch cohorts? Yes. So in the uh, so in in the second film's post credit sequence, she is again going back, and she's being seen with like you know all the blood and stuff, and then she giving birth to a head, giving birth yeah. to Art's severed head, uh, to kind of signify that he's kind of got some regeneration going. So well, they are. They already showed that. I mean, that's that's. Was it the credit scene in one or the opening of two? They already showed that he he's some sort of supernatural being. That's two, that's and two. the the thing that I want to comment on specifically with that is, I, I love that. Like, <laughs> I love how like Leon in interviews has like talked about like uh, not really knowing that art was going to be kind of accepted to be this like cultural icon and the way that, you know, like a modern day Freddie or Jason would. And he initially says that like, you know, when you have the opening to two, there is this like sequence where art is seen 
as the supernatural being like he's regenerated he's a demon but like even he didn't really know that or understand that so like when you look at that sequence of regeneration you watch his face there's almost like this like surprise or shock value and i'm really kind of grateful that they explored that because i think that's one of the things that you know as we've kind of when you look at the 80s boom that's something that was largely kind of missed they were just like studios were like just figure out a way to to bring him back i mean going from h2o to resurrection is a great example of that it was the it was actually one of the EMTs, and Michael's been alive this whole time. It's one of the just the the worst excuses, you know. They've they've tried cult of thorn. They you know, they they gave up explaining why Jason keeps coming back. And I like that Leon kind of really expanded and like gave us a reason and built a mythology around Art the Clown in that way. Well, I think. Jason was more of a revenant than anything else on dead back for vengeance, basically. Um, Freddy's the dream demon and they never, there's no clear cut thing of what Michael Myers is. So then you're, there's not. <laughs> it's again, it goes back to Halloween is probably the only franchise that you choose your own adventure. Yes, I mean you could. <laughs> I would. I would argue that choose your own adventure is more or less linked to uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre because every mm, I do. iteration of that family is something new. It's something different. Um, but it's it's not like Halloween where it's you watch one and two and then watch these movies for one storyline or you watch one and then these movies for a different storyline. It's just like almost like reboots of the series just over and over again. That's the same idea for TCM. It's just instead of telling one story over two or three movies, they're like, we're just going to reboot it every time. And it's just going to be like, Hey, y'all remember why you love violence and cannibals. (laughs) But I think it's amusing that art is a mime and they keep calling him a clown. That's that's fair. I, I, I also <laughs> like speaking of, of Halloween real quick. So there's there's a sequence in uh the the pizza place where uh, like after the, the guy kicks art out and you know for pooping all over the walls and spelling out his name and in, in beans. He uh he like gets decapitated and then gets turned into a jack o' lantern essentially. I believe the character uh, is man o' lantern. Man o' lantern. <laughs> I thought I thought he was more like a candle. They'll never turn the lights out on you. Uh, I'm almost curious if this actually influenced uh Halloween 2018 or if it's just a coincidence because there is a scene in 2018 where. Uh, Karen's husband goes out to the car to the cops and pulls open the door and you have one cop has a head of severed head of the other cop in his hand and it's like kind of like a jack-o'-lantern effect I don't know but what was it David Goyer Green or whatever his name is David Gordon Green Gordon Green whatever that did Halloween ends and then the following the exorcist and got himself fired from like everything because they did so bad. I don't know how you make two movies that were so good and then just like fumble the ball that hard on the third one to not explain anything. I will get into that. I I I know why they did that, and I I can tell you in in a later date why they did it. But let's take a commercial break real quick. Uh, so uh, we're gonna during this commercial break, we're gonna play you guys an interview that I did with uh, the band I Conqueror. I Conqueror is gonna be opening up our Monsters for Mental Health fundraising show this upcoming Friday. I'm sorry, Saturday, uh, October. St- Fifth at another round. Tickets are now on sale. You guys can click the links in the show notes below. Wine and War Pain, Nine Realms, To Be a King, and Betty Gray are also going to be playing. It's going to be a great night. So dress up, support mental health awareness and education 
We'll be right back. If you or someone you know is listening to this podcast right now and you're struggling with suicide, addiction, self-harm, or depression, we encourage you guys to please reach out. This is the heartbeat of why we do what we do. Suicide is currently the 10th leading cause of death in the United States, and as of this recording, there are 132 suicides that take place each and every day on American soil. And when you scale back internationally, there are 800,000 successful suicides. That is one death roughly every 40 seconds. So if you were someone you know is struggling, you guys can go to victimsandvillains.net forward slash hope. That resource is going to be right in the description wherever you guys are currently listening or streaming this. There you'll find resources that include the National Suicide lifeline which is 1-800-273-8255 you can also text help to 741-741 we also have a plethora of other resources including churches getting connected with counselors lgbt resources like the trevor project and also veteran hotline as well please if you hear nothing else in the show, understand that you, yes, you listening to this right now, have value and worth. We get it. Suicide, depression, mental health, these are hard topics, and the stigma around them doesn't make it any easier. But please consider the resources right in the descriptions below, wherever you guys are listening, because, once again, you have value and you have worth. So please, stay with us. Well, let's go ahead and get introductions out of the way, uh, starting from left to right. Go ahead and introduce yourselves and the role that you play within the band. All right. Uh, my name's Sean Miller. I play guitar. Um, yep. I'm Sean Brown. I play bass. Justin Dixon, vocalist. Zach Pass, play guitar. And our drummer couldn't make it this time. His name's Matt Robinson. He's not here today with us. I thought you guys were a five piece. I was, yeah, I was kind are. of thrown yeah. off. <laughs> he has a long way to, to drive out here, so he's, he's here in spirit. Here. Yeah. Well, usually don't get typically get the privilege of asking bands this because most of the bands that we've had on this series so far have been projects that have been ongoing for several years. You guys are the fortunate ones that you guys are a project that kind of just started. Can you talk about the origins of I Conqueror and how you guys kind of formed, the, how you guys kind of got the sound that you guys have now? Yeah. Um, it kind of started uh, way back when, like 2017, really. Yeah, we, we've been we've been to a few different things, really. It took us a minute. Uh, so me and Justin, the singer, I used to produce bands and record them. And then uh, he had an old band named Provoke Destroy uh, from Virginia Beach area. And uh, we, I was recording him and then always liked his voice. And then that his stuff had kind of fizzled out. And then I was in between bands. So we started writing some songs together. Uh, and then uh, most of us work at Newport News Shipbuilding. And I ended up meeting Zach here at our guitars. He just so happened to like start the same pipe fitting crew as me. And we just, you know, started talking music. Uh, and he's from, um, the Lancaster area, so he's got a lot of history with metal and stuff like that. Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Yeah. Um, so yeah, Lancaster, Pennsylvania. And so we just started. He had some stuff that he had already written, and he wanted to record it. So I was like, I can do that. Um, and we started writing songs, and like, well, this will work out for Justin to get some vocals on it, and it just kind of started like that, and slowly um, adding people and. Uh, trying out different sounds, seeing what would work. And then we uh, ended up hitting, finding a, an old buddy of Justin's, um, Will Beasley was a producer that he knew and we recorded him. So our first EP was with uh, Will Beasley in Richmond. Uh, and then branched out a little bit to uh, another guy that we met, um, Mikey Canoy. He's in a band called Set for Tomorrow from Richmond. Yeah. Uh, well, area. Yeah. Shout uh, out to Mikey. Yeah. So we uh, <laughs> we started uh, working with him, and that's our our latest EP is uh, all with him. So yeah, that's kind of where we're at, trying to play shows when we can, and you know, do uh, anything we can. You know. 
I'm kind of curious, uh, going from, you know, kind of being a garage, uh, you know, when you guys kind of start out the garage or the practice space, respectively, what's the writing process been like for you guys kind of coming from other bands and, or maybe even to having it, this just be a hobby and then maybe, or it's been a while. Like what's the writing process like for you guys? Uh, it usually starts out as a riff. Then, uh, so either me or Sean will come up with the riff and then Sean will put drums behind it, do some production over it. Then we kind of bring it to the whole uh, team and see if it's a yay or nay or hey, how we feel about it. Um, sometimes we've written a song just in like 15 minutes. And then we've written a song that took us like five months. <laughs> oh, yeah. So. And it wrote that song also. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then we uh, we tend to take it to our producer at the time. We'll, we'll do all we know to do with it. Um, kind of, you know, we get stuck in our head sometimes you hear something so many times that you wrote and you can't hear anything different but you know it could be better so that's where the producer will come in and we can take it to like mikey now and he'll amp it up he'll chop it up into like how he's he knows the directions we want to go or at least try to at the moment or whatever the song is about um and bring us down kind of fizzle it down and get us focused and then uh, we'll usually take a weekend with him and like chop it up basically reverse it. engineering yeah um yeah we we uh it's a big process and each song is it's kind of hit or miss sometimes they work sometimes they don't sometimes uh yeah you got to start over um but yeah that's kind of where it goes and every song's kind of different we try to have an open mind on everything everyone who has hands on it yeah or has a part in it if you will now I've talked about this over the course of this year with a multitude of bands kind of talking about the current landscape of music being very single driven, uh, very like content uh, heavy when it comes to things like, you know, TikTok and Instagram and being very uh, focused on that. You guys kind of took a different approach to that when you guys did the, um, the EP last year, self-titled, this year you guys have released uh two singles in panic and fear what is it uh about this last year compared to this year that has kind of made you you know change gears to release the the singles uh that you guys have released um well this time it was really we had, we'd kind of wrapped up that sound and, and with uh what we were going for and that was really a, a conglomeration of a bunch of singles as well and these two that we have out we have another one uh coming out called uh rapture that will wrap up this ep uh it comes out this friday september 6th as well um and uh so this new ep is about it's kind of a concept that uh our singer justin had about how it's actually it's, it's all of our struggles with anxiety and and uh just you know a lot of mental in and outs that you know people go through and so he was like you know he wanted to have a i'm not gonna let him talk about it but um yeah so i mean like so they originally started out with uh like the song panic basis well written off panic attacks and basically how that was kind of brand new to to, to really experience kind of that you know growing up you're kind of told you know all oh, that's just that's nonsense it's just one of those things you people make up um but then you experience one you're like oh, oh shit now my entire you know background and then the uh, solid ground that I thought was real was kind of all over the place. So it kind of turned into one of those where basically I was like, we'll just write about it a little bit and see if we can get on this path and see what um what we haven't touched on yet. And uh, it got personal at times and it, I think it's kind of brought up a little more different flavor and sound. And uh, I think we're all kind of cool with that for the most part. So I mean yeah. So this this EP is about it's all it's all it's called hell in my head. So mm -hmm. it's all about um there's panic, there's fear, and there's rapture. So it's about trying to overcome and figure out ways to, you know, get yourself through tough times kind of thing. And so he came up with this idea about having, it's in a way, it's a concept album, uh, not too deep or, you know, out there. But uh, so that's why we're going to wrap up this one and we'll pursue different ideas after this. But uh, in the singles, it just, it works out as far as like releasing singles. Um, it keeps us um more in the moment so we don't have to think of you know write a bunch of songs and go record a bunch of songs and by the time they're out kind of out you're not maybe feeling them as much as you were and this one keeps it fresh for us keeps it fresh for everybody 
Now, do you guys find in writing for like the different seasons of I Conqueror that you guys have to have a tendency to lean more towards those conceptual ideas and kind of say, once this feels closed, then let's, you know, focus on something else. Maybe let's progress the sound. Maybe let's deal, do a a different storyline, things like that. Yeah, I think so. Um, I think like this one, we've already, we're already worked. We have quite a few songs uh, in the holster right now. Um, And we're, kind of trying to feel out which way we want to go we definitely we want to switch things up a little bit um and kind of we're slowly defining what we want out of our sound and uh yeah that's part of it i don't know if we're going to go for a concept on the next one or not we're kind of see how things go see how we feel yeah. if we have a good idea that's kind of one thing also yeah that's that's a big part we don't want to force anything we're all about how natural it comes and it like he naturally came by this idea and so it, that resonates with all of us so and if something like that pops up again we're definitely would go down it down that route you guys talked about something that i am always like really fascinated by with artists uh there was a you know, metalcore band way back in the early uh 2010s uh called my children and bride that had already had two really decent albums out and then uh, when they were doing a album, an interview for their third album, they were kind of talking about this is the sound that we've tried so hard to capture on this third one. This is like the best representation of what we think our sound is. Yeah. As artists, too, you you mentioned kind of just that redefining, uh, ever evolving idea of I Conqueror. Do you guys find that there's something similar? Like, at what point do you guys kind of cling to a sound that says like this feels just like everything we've tried to do with this band i think with the recent singles that we put out panic and fear and rapture that will come out is kind of the sound we chased when we were writing our first ep um and i think future music to come kind of like before as long as it makes sense to us we don't really have any rules um we have other songs on the past ep that kind of ventured out and uh, were kind of unique compared to what we uh, yeah. are more listened to stuff. Um, so we'll see what happens when we get there, but our EP right now, I would say we're really happy with, and that's a sound that we've kind of been striving for the past yeah. two years, I would say. And uh, in a similar sense, it is rewarding because we kind of, we have songs we're truly, pr- we love all our music, but the uh, EP we're coming out with is something we're truly proud of, so. Yeah, it's it's always evolving, and uh, it's one of those things we go for feeling more than anything. So, what song mm-hmm. we want to feel like next, and what kind of wear our heart on our sleeves, kind of thing. Um, so, it's ever evolving. It to say, um, I don't know. We haven't defined ourselves enough to know <laughs> if it's us, except like when the final product, and we're listening, and we're writing a song, especially with Mikey. We're like, if that part feels good, if that you know vocal feels good that is us that kind of is our sound if, if that makes any sense like uh it's it develops itself but um we know it when we hear it it's kind of weird we can feel it you know? even in the writing process i say we've grown so much especially justin on vocals oh yeah uh even guitar riff wise production wise um just where we're at now versus where we started and how we approach writing a riff or how justin approaches doing vocals has just matured so much so you guys mentioned something I want to go back to, uh, the theme of this new record being a publication that talks openly about mental health. I know uh, when we met at Canal Club at the Vilified Show back in July, we had talked about you know you guys really being a, a huge supporter of a lot of the things that we, we, we do and a lot of things we stand for. From a lyrical standpoint, when you guys are exploring things like panic attacks and fear and rapture and that the themes of hell in my head can you guys talk about the importance of being so vulnerable when it comes to uh writing these these types of and dealing with these subjects yes i mean honestly it's kind of one of those like i said um i feel like well, we in my eye spec i've been raised kind of one of those where you know you just deal with your stuff you know in a kind of a quiet place you don't really bring it up you don't really talk about it um this is what i always thought uh and then all of a sudden you know you kind of slowly venture out and talk about like what's what I got going on you realize everybody else you're close to 
has yeah. some similar stuff going on as well and you're kind of like okay well maybe i'm not so different maybe i'm not so weird and i shouldn't be so you know um uh, closed off on the issue of talking about it and uh yeah i think recently that that in the last year has definitely popped out and uh made it a whole entire different venue of just openly talking about things that i always thought were just you know keep it to yourself and deal with it yourself and um honestly the more you talk about it, the easier it is to ever come a little bit also yeah we all had our issues with different varieties of you know mental stuff but and luckily i mean the culture has come around to making it more open and easier for people to talk about but we want to make sure like we put our ourselves out there as well with that and uh let people know that that's how we, we've had issues and i don't think those issues will necessarily get be gone one day but if we can deal with it learn how to deal with it and like and we're hoping you just can help you know it always helped us i know every one of us had our issues and we put on certain records and stuff like that and it becomes you feel a little bit better you can get yeah. that out of your head you know, so. And that's the beautiful thing about medium is like uh, just art in general, whether that's music or film or comic books or video games, being able to connect with characters or lyrics or any anything really that really resonates with whatever you're going for. I mean, I, I have quite a few tattoos on me that are bands that have just been impacts on me, whether that's been under oath or a sleeper, you know, Yep. it's again it goes back to that you know from that reminder that you're not alone you know, your your journey is your story but also there are people that have very similar stories and overlaps with yours yep. well i think that's going to do it for us but before we go where can people find you guys and find the music <laughs> Uh, well, we're on every music thing there is, uh, Spotify, Apple, Amazon, YouTube, Deezer, uh, iHeartRadio, all the stuff. So that's iConqueror, VA is usually the, if it's, it's not iConqueror, it'll be iConqueror, VA. And that's on, you know, with the TikTok, and Instagram, Instagram, and Facebook. We're not big social media guys, but we do try to put stuff out there when we feel like we've got something. We're not, we're uh, in our 30s, so kind of came out after us and so we're not on the bandwagon but we still want to we still try a little bit but we don't want to see inauthentic we're very authentic people so yeah. if we're not forcing if it's out there we're not forcing anything uh and so we're hoping to get better about that we're trying to you know be more social but at the same time we'd rather put out something genuine than just do it because it's a fad so we do respond pretty fast though so oh, that's yeah. one good thing about us. us yeah and uh we're <laughs> We've got the show October 5th, but we're looking yeah. at a few other ones um, uh, as soon as we can, hopefully before the end of the year. Um, if not, we'll we'll be out there next year. Well, Sean beat me to the punch, but yes, you guys can catch these guys a part of our Monsters for Mental Health fundraising show at another round bar and grill here in Richmond. And they're also going to be playing with Wine and War Pain, Nine Realms, To Be a King, and betty gray so make sure that you guys uh and you guys can get tickets now there it will provide a link in the show notes below along with all of the stuff to follow and check out i conquer how would you guys like to help us get mental health resources into schools conventions and other events well now you can Simply go to patreon.com forward slash victims and villains for as little as $1 a month. You guys can help us get mental health resources into current and upcoming generations, educate and break down stigma surrounding mental health, suicide, and depression, and to get exclusive content that you can't get anywhere else. And you guys can tell us which Nicolas Cage movie you want us to cover, and we'll do it. All it takes to get started is to go to patreon.com forward slash victims and villains or simply click the link in the episode description wherever you guys are currently listening or streaming this episode. Pick your tier and get started today. Yes, it's that simple. So quickly select the tier that you want and help us get hope into the hands of the depressed and the suicidal today. Welcome back to Victims. Uh, blah. 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 blah.
Welcome back to Abyss Gazing. We are jumping into the world of Art the Clown and with a Terrifier 2, well, Terrifier double feature. Uh, I want to also say the in the first one, while we're still talking about that one, the gun gag where he like has like hidden the gun in right before he shoots Terra does not get talked about enough. Like that's a great gag. I'm trying to remember. Yeah, that, I'm trying to remember the gag. That's wow. probably why it doesn't get talked about. It talked about it. <laughs> it's it's like one of my favorites in these two films, and it's just like she like basically comes up to him and like he turns around and just like shoots her point blank with a gun. Like oh, is that when he had oh uh, you talking yeah, hair from word. the other girl? Yeah. Yeah, where he pretended to be scene. the other girl. Yeah, they flip. Her. Yeah, I got you. I remember that. It now. Okay, that was something. The fact that he pulls out a gun and starts shooting is something you don't see in a lot of slashers. No, Freddy's Which, got his hands. Jason's got his machetes and weed eaters and God knows what else. And Michael Myers has bags. his knives. <laughs> that was one of the best scenes ever. <laughs> Beating a person with another person in a sleeping bag. <laughs> but yeah, and Michael Myers always had his uh, butcher knife. Yeah. Uh, and then he's got a bag of tricks, Art does. Yeah. Mm. And he's always got different junk. But the fact that he just randomly pulls out a gun is like, fuck it. <laughs> I. I that's one of the things that I really love, and it goes back to what I was saying originally about just terror. The terrifier films really kind of turn expectations on like what you've come to expect, or like you're saying, like every serial or every killer icon that we've had up to this point always has a gimmick, always has a weapon of choice, but art doesn't really ever have that it's not really consistent you never know what he's going to use i mean he uses acid and a baseball bat in the second one like it's such a great combination he doesn't have a weapon of choice he has a trash bag of choice <laughs> you're not wrong but he carries them with them and he's got plenty and then I, going back to the scene you were talking about, I was going to make the comment of he didn't feel right in his own skin, so he had to wear somebody else's. Because <laughs> uh, after that happened, he was chasing, I forget who he was chasing, and they got in a little closet thing, and there was a people, and it was like he was sitting there like modeling the skin and the people. It's just one of them. Yeah, one of the that, is, uh, that would be Vicky. Vicky, yeah. Yeah, they're just, I mean... They have a target audience in mind with the terrifiers because there's a lot of people. I, I know some people that like horror movies, but they don't like the ter terrifiers. They're just too much for them. So I, I think it kind of falls in line with Saul, where it's a lot of people like them and a lot of people don't for that same reason. It, it's it's how graphic it is. It, it's definitely an acquired taste. And I, I also think that, like, you know, by modern violent standards, right? Like, we've come to kind of like, there's a level of it that's kind of like, oh, it's normal to be kind of like desensitized by this. And, but I think with these films, these films really kind of push the envelope to where there's a scene in Terrifier 3 that Leon's gone on record talking about how the uh like no major studio would like touch it so like you know it, he just didn't want to do anything with it or like you know but i think most of the time even when we see studios like a24 or neon release something it's it's very tame and if there is a violence level of blood or gore the way that you have with terrifiers like i would also throw the substance in that that conversation i know both of you guys haven't seen it yet but it's a really it has like gory graphic sequences that are very in tone with this one and like evil dead's like another example like films like that or you know hostile or saw are like an acquired taste I don't know. Evil Dead, I love the moment I saw it. There was no acquisition to the taste needed. 
but yeah. that's you. That's not the general audience. Yeah. I mean, that's not everybody. It's like um, going back and watching Saw is like sometimes I'm, hey, why were people afraid of this? It's just whatever. But well, there's, there's a common problem with people that watch a lot of horror movies is they no longer become shocking or scary. Yeah, because you become you become no. desensitized you, to yeah. it. And yeah. there's a there's a great moment in the the first one where we meet a woman that is uh, we don't we don't ever get her name but like she's uh she's just a baby with the uh, the, the woman with the, baby. With the baby doll, yeah. And she says like while uh I believe it's Tara is getting like just brutally beaten or like she's watching dawn be like castrated essentially uh it, she says you know it's only the wind it can't hurt you and it's that's such a commentary on how we handle violence not necessarily as a movie going audience but also as a society you know there are stories that we read where it talks about you know i, I think i think it was in like New York or it was in a borough of a very populated area and a woman got beaten and raped multiple people hurt her and didn't do shit. And I, I think that that's kind of the mentality we take where it's like, you can see she's uncomfortable, but also at the same time, you know, she kind of goes, ah, it's just the wind, you know, I can't hurt you. Like we don't want to get involved. We don't want anything. And it's just because again, I, I think that's a, uh, that goes back to how we view violence. Like, you know, I mark to your point, I don't ever get shocked and awed by, by violence, but I remember the first time I saw terrifier too. And it, the scene with uh, the bleach scene came on and he added salt in the wound. That was one moment where I was like visibly like uncomfortable for like the first time. Like there are sequences in the, substance that are also like that where i was like uh this is kind of gross there you know there there are like very few scenes that i've seen come out like there's probably the birth scene in um either men or the first omen is another like example yeah. of like getting under your skin yeah Sorry. i mean and that's that was an important from there were family and there was, uh, I mean, there's some scenes in the second one that is more like, doesn't really scare me. It's more like, wow, or whatever, especially like the bedroom scene. That's the one that got all the hype and everything that around the theaters, people were the getting bleach sick. Scene. Yeah, the bleach yeah. scene, the bedroom scene where he's completely stripping the skin off her and everything. That's that's kind of when I was like, yeah, this is kind of like a, if Saw and a slasher had a baby was that scene really what what i loved about that scene at the end and because we made the comment of it would make it better if he made her like a puppet and then she turns around and starts talking to her mom she kind of does in, kind of kind in, of. In, in the end where like she becomes like the the human the head becomes the the candy bowl for the the trick or treaters, and like they're all sitting there, like, "Oh my gosh, this is so cool!" And it says, "Oh my gosh, this is so sticky." Oh, that's true too. Yeah, I feel like there were a lot of people that cheered when the mom got blown away in the garage. Because she was kind of a bitch. Yeah, she's always the hardest part to watch that second film. Like, I think, I think. And you can call me crazy if you would. I think that it's the second one is like one of the best horror movies we've gotten. And that is always the moment where I'm like, everything is like terrific about this film, except for the mom's acting. Like, I don't know what it is about the mom. She just like everyone else is kind of like doing really well in terms of like acting emotionally. And she's just kind of always been stale for me. Yeah, I mean, I was thinking the same thing. It's the kids and all kind of did great in it, but the mom just, she she could just cook the bacon. She doesn't have to give any kind of acting at that point. 
Oh, or she can everything get mashed potatoes. Everything <laughs> to me, both of them have that kind of high quality B movie feel to them. Sure. Which typically comes with some questionable acting. Yeah, every once in a while. Um <laughs> the the first one is the the first one like there's no like performance that like really sits stands out to me. But the second one you look at it and I, I would say David Howard Thornton like does an incredible job for being silent quite literally the entirety of his two almost two and a half hour performance. But also like I would I would definitely say that like Lauren Lavera gives like an amazing performance and it's probably one of the reasons that I value her as a final girl so freaking much. Oh, dude playing art. I can't remember his name. You know what it's Thornton. Yeah. yeah. He's, this one he really seems like he understands the assignment, so to I, speak. He I'm, he was getting the hang of it in one and the others, and this one he's he kind of seems like he knows who he is at this point. I think it's not just him, I think it's Leon because I don't think that Leon expected the kind of reception that the first film got. And so they worked on this film for so long. There's, you know, we're two years between Terrifier 2 and Terrifier 3. Like they they knew the direction they wanted to go with it. They built the hype around it. And they've done a very good job at doing just that. But when you look at the the time gap between Terrifier and Terrifier 2, it is almost this how do we tell a story that is elevating the, the insanity of the first film but also understand art the clown more and the fact that this film starts off with art where art's not really seen in i think for like the first like 20 or 25 minutes of the first film he's not he's not really present a super lot but like we spend the first 10 gruesome minutes with this character and like right out the gate, like Leon knows that people are coming here for art. They want more art. They don't care. Uh, they just want to see him just do some really messed up shit. And I think that not only does Thornton understand the assignment, but I also think Leon understood what audiences wanted. Well, one of the big differences between one and two is one is just kind of your stereotypical slasher sure two was like okay we accidentally made a massive success so now let's expand it but not do it that detracts from the movie kind of thing so that's what they did with two was they started adding some sort of outside story elements that were never even hinted at in the first one um and you start getting into supernatural stuff with Sienna and with art and the little girl. Is she real? Is she not? Uh, things like that. And starting to introduce, it's almost like they're hinting towards getting towards a storyline with a killer clown family. I, I thought I there would, were mimes, Mark. That whatever. <laughs> <laughs> I would 100% be here for that, honestly, because, because you've got art, you've got the little girl that you don't know if it's real or not, and mm -hmm. you've got the survivor from the first one who's killing people and is completely mm -hmm. batshit crazy at this point. So you've got at least three characters in the family. So I, I know that I, I crap on Rob Zombie's Halloween movies, the first one, a lot. But I, I think when you look at the director's cut of the second one, it was this kind of like Lori had this kind of like acceptance of like, I'm related to a serial killer and I'm going to take up this mantle now. And so there are numerous unread, like unmade third films before they ended up going back to 2018 where they were going to explore that, where what would happen if Lori took up the mantle of the shape and I would be so fascinated to see something like that struggle between, you know, whether that is Vicky or that would be 
uh, Vicky or what is uh, Sienna? Yeah, I was going to say, you mentioned about Art. I love the fact that they put the little girl in there to play off of Art to give him more. It seemed like it gave him a little bit more dynamic to me, just more of a, hey, look, this is another one. And is she, like you mentioned, is she in his mind or is she real? And the fact that she joins in the whole thing, I, I kind of liked having the extra in there. But then you see the brother and Sienna start seeing her too. So, so goes back to my question. It hints that they're linked to them. Is it because they're linked? Well, so you also see that there's like callbacks, like when uh, the brother is like kind of dissecting the father's art, and you kind of see the notebook, and he has the the vagina scene from the first one, and you have like that throwaway scene between uh, Sienna's friend and her boyfriend, where. Uh, he's she's like recounting giving the exposition about how like he was mentally ill and he got like really seriously like uh just really twisted towards the end and like got really nasty towards sienna and ultimately kind of just you know committed suicide uh, essentially and you know and he killed himself and we're kind of left with that and i'm almost kind of wondering if that is like an underlining thing of why they are seeing them it's also the it's also goes back to this notion of you know stepping outside of the film talking about how whether we like it or not there are things within our dna that are going to take on traits of our parents and you know depression uh anxiety stuff like that yeah that's what i was going to say anxiety depression um thoughts suicide think all kinds of stuff can be passed along in mental i mean there's always mental illness and it shows a lot of it in this movie that yeah especially when they're talking about the xanax and things like that it leans to, into all that so I had a thought about the whole thing because they never show Art's origin. What if Art is the dad? I thought, I thought about that too. <laughs> <laughs> and it brings it it brings it back to my other thing I was gonna bring up. They showed the sketchbook from the dad that they had all the clippings in there and the picture of art. So either art is art the dad or is it like uh was it Slender or was Man? he a victim of art? Yeah. Or I mean, was art kind of like what was it years ago, Slenderman, where yeah. everybody started believing about it, and then all of a sudden there's sightings and everything or whatever. I mean, you could also chalk it up to uh you know, him being the reason that art was even resurrected in the first place you know maybe he is mm -hmm. the reason that art is supernatural now yeah i mean there's there's no chucky doll so i know that he didn't kind of <laughs> put himself into there but uh yeah either i was figuring it might be the dad or like he said somebody that he was killed by art or even you know, somehow connected to that family. So we, we got a few minutes left in the show and our guest has some technical problems, but he's joining us now. So I want to give Zach some, uh, some leeway to talk about this movie and kind of his thoughts and his theories about it uh, from the band to be a King, Mr. Zach Montgomery. Hey, what's up guys. I, so I, I actually joined in a little late just because my, uh, I had some other meetings to attend and then technical difficulties even joining in. So sorry about that. It's fine. But um, I, I've always been a, a, a big fan of the, the Terrifier movies. Um, and and, and kind of like you guys were talking about with the, the uh, mental health, um, it, I, I resonate a lot with uh, some of the stuff like 
the, the Xanax scene and um, uh, stuff like that. It, it just, uh, you know, especially what Victims and Villains stands for. It, it It's, um, you know, seeing horror movies and things like that, it, it just really helps um, uh, me um, personally uh, deal with my anxiety because it's fictional to me. You know what I mean? And, and you kind of get to place, you know, the, the anxiety and, and things like that and try to make myself um, believe that there, there, there's a way out of uh, these types of things. So I want to dissect some of the because we've, we've established at this point in the conversation that the first Terrifier film is really, as Mark said, a, a standard classic. But the second one really does dive a lot deeper into like mental health. It has notes of you know grief. But before we get there, I want to say this real quick. Obviously, this is an indie film, and one of the biggest indie films of all time is Kevin Smith's Clerks. And it seems like a really weird thing to bring up on a horror podcast, but there is a nod in here to the original Clerks. Do you got? Did you guys catch it? No. I've never been a big fan of his movies. Just I think I, I never. It. So, so I wouldn't have caught it. So there is a scene in when they first get to the Halloween party, and the guy that shows up uh, and is like complimenting Sienna's costume. He is dressed up as Randall from Clerks. What? Oh crap! <laughs> he was wasn't he? <laughs> I was still looking at the ghost guy and then I wouldn't pay attention. Cause yeah, it's it's a very off brand, but like very like obvious nod to, to clerks. Yeah, that that's a I classic would, right there. I would have never got it. <laughs> the more you know. <laughs> See, I wasn't looking for it. Now I'm gonna have to go back and watch it and just look for it or go to that scene so I can see it. Yeah, that's actually what I'm doing right now. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm a I'm a big Clerks fan, so that, I don't know how I would have missed that. It's a it's a great little movie, uh, Mark. It makes me sad that you don't like Kevin Smith. I just I mean I uh-huh. like Mallrats was kind of funny, but the rest of them I just I I just couldn't get into them. Clerks three I remember seeing in theaters and bawling like a child. It was <laughs> such a sad movie. Hogba chasing Amy. Come on, man. Yeah. Chasing Amy is, oh, man. Wow. One of the best films of the 90s. He, he, yeah. He's one of my favorites to any of his movies. I always made sure to try to watch them. And, and side note, he they invited him into that, uh, that 90s show, the spinoff yeah. from the 70s. He's in the second season, but he was at the end of the first one. So. Uh, Jay and as Jay and Silent Bob, that '90s show is so bad. Hey, I watched it just for them. So, all right, all right, all but right. Anyway, we're back on topic. You know, there's, uh, but going back into this, you know, to the to the mental health aspect, um, this film explores grief really, really well. I love that. You know, we've we've ex- we've talked about grief over the course of you know. 100 episodes but i think this this film does a really good job at exploring what that process looks like and how you see it with uh the the son's character where he is essentially like as a result of like his grief uh you know he goes throughout and really you know jumps into like true crime and like becomes like really obsessed with that and just has like really uh you know unhealthy obsessions i think is probably the best way to do that and that looks different for you know different people but then you have like sienna that like dives into art and like that's the thing that she does and that's the thing that you know she wants to do and wants to talk about him and you have the the mom uh that Barbara that doesn't want to have those conversations that just, just kind of want to act like it's everything's okay. And that like, it's going to be fine. And she's trying to like adjust to the reality of now being a single mom. And I think this film explores that grief is not this one size fits all uh, option that there are 
there's a, a multitude of, of ways that it, it can go. Yeah. And building off the mom thing, she's not only doing that, she's trying to probably make up for like the money that's lost, trying to take care of the family and trying to be both at once. There's a great line that that she says early on in the film where she's talking to Sienna and she says, you know, you can't you keep everything bottled up and it's not healthy. And I, I think that I think it's such a interesting viewpoint when it talks about grief because people expect that, you know, grief is just like you got to be like, oh, I'm ready to talk about it. And I do think that it is vastly unhealthy to kind of keep everything bottled up and then it, it explodes because yep. that is probably what has caused some of the biggest fights in my marriage. But, uh, yep. uh, you know, I think it's healthy to kind of express things and, and talk about things and have open dialogue about things, but it has to be in, in your time. And it goes back to this grief is not this linear journey. It is something that could, for some people take two months, for some people may take two years. Yeah, if, if you don't express your grief or, and again, you may not even realize you're going through the grief, You others may yeah. see it and without knowing, sometimes you don't know to address it, so. Yeah, I, I, I personally uh, bottle things up myself and until things explode and obviously, I, you know, I can't think of an instance where it is healthy, but um, it, it definitely sometimes I guess you just don't know how to express it. Well, I think building off of that, that comes into this idea of how societally speaking, you know, we're all men on this this call and all of us have been married at one point or another. Some of us are parents, some of us are not. But, you know, societally speaking, we are expected to bottle everything up and not to talk about your feelings because if you talk about your feelings that's a sign of grief and that goes to back to this old adage of how our fathers and the fathers before them and the fathers before them really handled mental health and how they kind of brought that down the line well i mean what's the saying men um Women, children, and dogs are loved unconditionally. Men are loved for what they bring to the table. Oof. I have not heard that, but I yeah. like that. You <laughs> hadn't heard that before? I have no. not. No. And, and going back to the Yeah, no. men. No, men not me. <laughs> for the most part, men tend to be judged on what they do and what they bring to the table, what they can provide. And if you do anything outside of that, you're looked down upon. If you show any sort of signs of depression or sadness, it's weakness and frowned upon. That's what I was going to say. Yeah, <laughs> I was, I was going to say we were uh, this past oh. weekend at uh, at Haunted Screams. We had the we had the the, the privilege of, of speaking with uh, Junko Bailey, and she's uh, most famously known for The Grudge, but she is uh, by nature was born in Japan and she lives in Canada, but she is essentially, we got talking about uh, how there is, you know, this American idea of you, your identity is found in what you do. And so it goes back to what you're saying, Mark, about like, it's only what you can provide. And that's a really narrow way of looking at men's mental health, especially the complexities that, that come with that. You know, whether it's, it's not so much a narrow way of looking at it, it's an accurate way of looking at it. I don't like it. So I'm saying <laughs> I, I'm like arguing it. it's a narrow way. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you could not like it all you want, but that's that's how it is. And that's how it's been for a very long time. And I think mm -hmm. that's the reason why we we need to push for change. Right. Like I, I think that's the reason why there's a, a need for men to take their mental health seriously just because you can't see something doesn't necessarily mean that you know something's wrong with you we talked about the this past weekend at haunted streams during our panel that uh, you know science has taught us that if you don't talk about your mental health or if you don't have friends or a healthy community then it actually starts increasing your chances for premature death 
heart disease, heart attack. Like there's, there's so many physical ailments that can actually result in not talking about your mental health. I mean, I do the latter of that just fine with some good food, but (laughs) (laughs) maybe that's just your coping mechanism. Who knows? I mean, somebody had to learn to cook in the house. (laughs) Oh, I thought you picked up more food out there now that you moved. (laughs) Get all the briskets and barbecue and all. I don't have a smoker yet. But I will say this, that I would encourage any man listening to this right now to to reach out, start conversations about your mental health. So, But if you or someone you know is struggling with mental health, you guys can go to victimsandvillains.net forward slash hope. You guys can get uh, access to our mental health resource library. Just start those conversations because they are important. I speak, I speak that from experience. Um, I've known people that have unfortunately died by suicide and know what that feels like. And that's a deep pain that I wouldn't, would not wish on my worst enemy. Yeah. Just ignore me. I'm kind of a dick sometimes. We know. We know. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> with that, uh, Zach, I know you joined us late. We're getting ready yeah. here uh, to be a King's song, Fear Not. But where can people find you online and where can people check out the band? Oh, man. So you can you can find us on pretty much every social platform, Facebook, Instagram, um, music. Uh, you can find us on um, Spotify, Apple Music, um, Google Play, uh, Pandora, all of that. Um, got some new, new music releasing in uh, end of October, so be looking out for that as well. And the, this, the Fear Not album, all of that was obviously based off of facing depressions and anxiety and, and things like that. So well, you guys can also the conversation. Yeah, that's awesome, man. I'm I'm really excited to to hear new stuff from you guys. I, I really always love seeing you guys live and just checking you guys out. So long time coming. Yeah, and, and so speaking of that, you guys can catch them. We're doing a, a fundraiser for our mental health education efforts this Saturday at another round in Richmond, Virginia. It's got a stacked lineup, Wine and War Paint, Nine Realms, To Be a King, Betty Gray, mm-hmm. I Conqueror, who we heard from earlier in the episode. All of them, you guys can uh, dress up, help us raise money for mental health education. Tickets are on sale now, or you can get them at the door. We'll provide links in the show notes below for more information on where to get the tickets and times it starts, all of that other stuff. But Billy, where can people find you online? Everybody can find me at Letterbox at BA Boy 99. And uh, you can ask Mark where he hides out, but you may not be able to find him there. <laughs> um, I got some painting stuff that I don't update very often on Instagram. Titanium Juggernaut painting. <laughs> That's about it. And here. <laughs> That's true. You can also catch them here. So wherever you guys get your podcast from, just search a Biscazing. But you guys can find me. I am uh, on letterbox as well at captain nostalgia you guys can find our parent company victims and villains we are on facebook instagram youtube spotify apple Podcasts, wherever you guys get your podcasts from and also if you guys would like to support our mental health education efforts patreon.com forward slash victims and villains where you can get video versions of the podcast you're currently listening to and see all of our lovely faces so until next time remember the longer you gaze into the abyss, the more the abyss gazes back into you. Once again, we're leaving you guys this week with To Be A King, which you guys can catch this Saturday at another round for our Monsters for Mental Health fundraising show. This is Fear Not. We'll see you guys next week. <laughs>